I really wanted to do this workshop because I was thinking about my life <laughs> and what dictates my life. And it's, and it's this. It's writing and it's stress. Um, and I feel like it dictated my undergrad life too. So I kind of wanted to have a space where we can sit and chat about ways we can kind of talk about it. So I actually want to start with you guys, if we can. We're going to have like a little bit of a sharing circle. Like not like, a, not like a huge one, but a little one. So on a scale of like 1 to 10, when you think about what you've got going on, how stressed are you? You can just shout it out. Okay, <laughs> solid eight, 10. 3, did I get a 3? 7. 7? 5? Seven. 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 I'm stressed, but probably not <laughs> stressed <laughs> hearing the same Stress hearing the sense. Yeah, I mean, I think if you ask most students, right, how stressed am I on a scale of 1 to 10, very rarely do you hear under 5. And I think it's kind of worth thinking about for a second why that is. And obviously, the, the obvious answer is right in front of us, right? It's where we are. College is, is dictated by stress, right? Short semesters, fewer assignments that are worth a lot more points. That's, that's fair. But I would say one of the other reasons why we are kind of in this constant state of stress is in the sort of wider cultural moment we're living in. Um, so have you ever heard the term burnout culture? Yeah. We're all millennials, right? Like, I'm at the end of millennial, but I'm there. <laughs> so burnout culture is basically glamorizing exhaustion, right? And there's something really satisfying about burnout culture, and that is your feelings are validated. I can like say, I love my bed, walk to a store, find a shirt that says I love my bed, go across the street to Target and find like 28 mugs that also say I love my bed. And that's good, that's satisfying. But I also think part of the problem is that it also creates new stigmas. And the major stigma for me is it becomes a lot harder to take a step back and say, you know what, actually, I really don't feel good. Like, I like my bed, sure, but I don't like feeling like I can't get out of my bed. And that's how I feel, by how stressed out I am. And that's the problem, when things become systemic, it really falls on you as the individual, right? All of a sudden it's like, I don't try hard enough. I can't handle like what the rock is cooking. Like I can't handle the stress of college, when in reality, no one should be living on a 10 or above stress level every single day of their life. That's really difficult. So what I wanted to talk about today is ways that we might handle our stress a little bit better when it comes to writing, since it dictates such a huge part of like, our college experience. So let's kind of have this out to you before we go on to the next one. What stresses you out about writing? And you can shout at me at any point. Yeah, go ahead. APA format. APA format, that is so fair. Formatting, okay, what else? You can just shout it out. Honestly, genuinely, what stresses you out when you're writing? Taking the paper too perfect, planning, I heard planning. Getting started. Yeah, getting started. The deadline, is that stressing you guys out? Yeah, I mean, that's like my major stress. Yeah, there's a lot of things that go into to writing anxiety. So writing anxiety, writer's block, whatever you wanna call it, I always think of like the time SpongeBob tries to write an essay, and that is like my life. <laughs> so uh, the things that can kind of trigger writing anxiety, they're various, and they depend on the person, and they depend on the class, right? It could be getting started. It could be like a great point. You're trying to edit it as you're going, right? This feel of perfection. You're trying to get the format right as you're going. Um, it could be because the deadline is literally coming up the next day. It could be because the deadline is a month away, right? Or sometimes it's really just a matter of the class. You might feel like an overall strong writer, but maybe you didn't have the most positive experience with this particular professor. Or maybe you're not having a really positive experience with this certain book that you're writing about. And all of a sudden getting started is a lot more difficult, right? Um, and then obviously, you know, your whole life doesn't run around your English 1975 class. <laughs> so, you know, part of it might just be because I'm having a really bad day and it's really hard to just turn around and say, well, you know what, I need to sit down and write five paragraphs because I need to, right? When you're not, you don't feel like you're in the headspace where you can. So I like to think about writing anxiety, sort of like a three-part system, right? The things that stress us out the most are typically time, how we're organizing ourselves, and how confident we're feeling, right? So the goal for us today is actually kind of bring those three, like sort of pick those three things apart a little bit and think about ways we might want to navigate those a little bit better, okay? And if you guys have any questions, I will point out, I love talking, if you cannot tell. <laughs> like, you don't have to raise your hand around me, it's totally cool. I'm Alex, you can just interrupt me, I won't find you rude. 
um, that would actually be great. And if you want to actually bring it personal to things that you have going on in your own classes, I'm fine with that too. So don't feel like you, you have to take a seat back the entire time. You can totally talk. Okay. So we're going to actually start with the scary one. We're going to start with time management. Because I feel like the deadline is always the a very daunting part. We're going to get through it together. It's fine. So another one. Let's, let's do one more poll, I swear. We're not going to do polls the entire time. But how many times do you guys feel like you do your best writing like a day or two before an essay is due? Yeah. Does anyone not feel that way? Yeah? Really? When do you feel like your best writing is? I'm just curious. Oh yeah, that's good, yeah. But you have another due date sort of set up, right? So like, I'm gonna take it to the writing center so my writing is strong, right? right? Cool, yeah, definitely. I think those are actually really great examples. Usually our writing is the strongest when we have some sort of deadline immediately in front of us because we're kind of forced to be productive all of a sudden, right? Like, our writing is the strongest like those final eight hours before an essay is due because there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> like, here's the wall and I'm here and it is just a one lane highway and I'm stuck. Right? And you have this sort of, do you ever have that feeling of just hyper focus when you get to the, do you feel that way when you're writing that last night? Yeah, kind of, right? That's adrenaline. So it's, if you play sports, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like, I am in the zone right now. I'm gonna get done what I need to get done. I'm gonna hand it in and it's done. I've made my peace with it. And the hard part about adrenaline is even though it gets this done, it is very, very addictive. And if you get into that mode of like, I write fast when I have that wall in front of me, it actually gets really, it's really difficult to break that cycle. So one of the ways you can start playing with that, maybe getting little smaller doses of adrenaline into your day, is actually figuring out your pace. So I like to think of writing as like running, right? If we're all sprinters, myself included, I like, my whole undergrad experience was like sprinting but fashion, like I was sprinting to class, I was sprinting for my deadlines, I was just sprinting for everything. <laughs> Um, we're going to think about ways that we might actually want to like elongate our pace, right? Carrying that adrenaline across a week as opposed to like eight hours. So there's a couple of ways to do this. I like to think of ratios, um, a work ratio and a, break ra and a break ratio. I'm a baker, so I think of literally everything in terms of ratios. <laughs> it's a weird thing that I have. Um, so a couple of ways you want to play with it and figure out what your individual pace is. The first is thinking about what kind of essay it is. If it's a research essay, or maybe it's for an English class and it's based off a fictional text, a lot of your essay writing is going to happen before you even sit down to the computer, right? You're going to have to actually read the text in some shape or form in order to write the essay. So one of the key ingredients is actually figuring out what is your reading pace. And there's actually a very simple way to do that. When you sit down to a text, especially once you get going, maybe not the first 20 pages or so, but like you hit maybe page 25, 30, and you're like, all right, I know the rhythm by now. Right, you know, I know the rhythm of the language. I may not like it, but I know it. Um, set a timer. And however long you feel like you can sit and read in one sitting. It could be half an hour. It could be an hour. You know, as long as you feel like your sort of focus mode goes, right? When that half or hour timer or that hour long timer goes off, look at how many pages you've actually read, right? Let's say it's 10 pages. You know, okay, I get through 10 pages in an hour. And the reason why that's actually really helpful is that your professors don't care how long your reading takes, right? <laughs> like, if you have 120 pages of reading to do by Friday, you can't be like, well, you don't understand. It takes me, you know, it takes me, you know, five hours to read the 10 pages. Actually, that's not true. You can come see me. But, right, the reality is that you still have to get through the 120 pages somehow. So what, a much more practical way to do it is actually think about it in terms of time, right? If I'm reading a very difficult, like, you know, theoretical or a science-based paper, okay, you know, it's 20 pages, but it takes me an hour to get through five pages. So I need at least four hours to get through that assignment. Does that make sense to everybody? And you can kind of do the same thing when it comes to your writing in a way. But I actually kind of revert to, to words, right? So if you're thinking about an average length paper, maybe it's four to five pages, right? Do you feel like three to four pages, four to five pages, 10 the max? Does that seem about right? Yeah, that's, that's about right, right? So. A nice way to break that down, instead of just simply page, is thinking about how many words go into a page. Typically, a page, if you do like a size 12, you know, times font, it's going to be like anywhere from 250 to 350 words, right? 
if you see a 250 word assignment on your syllabus, that doesn't seem that bad, right? You're like, all right, I can get, I can get through that in like a night. Like maybe it's just a response paper, that's fine, right? And a way to tap into that feeling of, of kind of navigating that stress a little bit easier is to start thinking about your long assignments as those breakdown of words, right? I don't have to write three pages tonight. I actually just have to write 350 words. And tomorrow I have to get through 350 words. And they don't have to be perfect. I just have to get them on paper. So that's another way you want to break it down. Yeah, shoot. Uh, I feel like sometimes when I'm writing, like if I spread it out over a couple of days, yeah. like it's sort of like, I don't know, like today I'll write in one style and then tomorrow like it changes a little. So it, it kind of messes up the flow. Yeah, no, that's actually a great question. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. So I want you to kind of keep that in your pocket. But I would say that's not necessarily <coughs> a bad thing. You know, I think it can be jarring if you get a nice rhythm. I will say this, if you have a nice rhythm going, I'm not telling you to stop it. If you find a nice zone of focus, you're like, I have a really great idea, right? We're gonna talk about that too, write that idea out. But I would say actually sitting down the next day and feeling like your style has changed, maybe your tone of voice has changed, that can actually be a really productive time for you to actually edit, you know? Um, because you actually might find that you like one tone of voice a little bit better. Or a lot of times when that feeling happens, it might be because you actually have found your argumentative tone. So the day before you're kind of getting your ideas on paper and you're thinking about it and the next day you sit down and you're like, all right, I know what I'm doing. So sometimes that jarring feeling actually can be a good thing. It just depends on, on the context. Do you know what I mean? But we'll talk about that without anything a little bit more. That's actually a great question. Is there any other questions? Does that seem doable a little bit? Yeah, and, and honestly, play with this. Play with this. You might be able to say, I can actually do a little bit more than that in one sitting. Like once I get a good writing mode, I'm not the kind of person that likes to interrupt it. That's great. You know, at the same time, you might actually be the person like, I need to do 100 words at a time and take a break. That's good too, right? It depends on the topic and the essay. I would say the one thing to think about when you're sort of playing with your pace, right, and trying to find out ratios that work for you, is make sure that you're actually doing breaks too. Breaks are critical, right? That, either that's breaking for the night, but a good handy break, I would say, is actually thinking about every hour of work you're doing, you're stopping for 10 minutes. And if you're working for more than two hours, you're stopping for some kind of food, right? Like half an hour of lunch or dinner, right? And when I say break, I, I mean physically break. Like get up, walk away from the computer, actually rest your eyes. That blue light of the computer is very aggressive on your eyes. So it helps kind of get your blood flowing a little bit more if you actually get up and like go out to the hall, run to the bathroom, grab a snack, you know? Or like if you're like me, I can't have my phone anywhere near me when I write. So, so like my 10 minute break, is actually going into the other room where I have my phone locked in a desk. And then I actually take it out. And then it's like, I check all those annoying group chats that I'm in. <laughs> and then I put it back. So uh, you can play with it. So if we're thinking about pace, right? So I have all my ingredients now. Another way you want to break down your writing so you have maybe like a more cohesive step so that you're not like kind of having that moment where you sit down and you're like, all right, what I'm doing? What am I doing today? Right? Like, where am I picking up where I left off? is actually thinking about writing in steps. So this can look a little scary. This does not mean days. <laughs> steps, having 10 steps doesn't mean it has to be in 10 days. It could be hours, it could be minutes. You might have certain assignments where you don't have to do all 10. I just kind of laid out what I think the basic tenets of essay writing would probably be, right? If you had like a standard, you know, three to four page essay or like, like a larger 10, 10 page research essay. Um, I mean, I won't go through them all, I won't read them all out loud, but generally it's thinking about writing as starting out by reviewing. All right, so like, what am I writing about? What do I have in front of me? Using that reviewing to generate some sort of question that you can use as your working thesis. So like, okay, what, do, what is it I wanna say? What do I care about, right? Going in to finally outline that idea, and that's your chance to kind of try things on, right? Getting a solid outline, we'll talk about that. Drafting, right? Editing, submitting. And then I actually build in two, I built in two check-ins with this one, but again, like you can play with this. But I think the two most helpful check-in times when you're actually writing a paper is at the very, very beginning and when you're getting towards the end. So when you get that research question kind of in your head, and you're like, oh, especially if it's a research paper, you're like, you know what, this is what I think I care about. This is what's striking my interest. That's the time you go to office hours because your professor is a wealth of knowledge. And it is actually like, a little known secret, professors love office hours, especially if it's not midterms week, right? Like if you, hand, if you get that assignment page and you're like, you know what, I'm gonna take a look at it tonight, it's not due for a couple of weeks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of 
feel things out a little bit, and then you go to your professor, and you're like, you know what, I know it's due in a couple of weeks, but I have this idea, and I want your thoughts, they're gonna love you. <laughs> they're gonna love you, because you're coming in, you're getting ahead, and that way when you find out problems, you have things going on, they already have an idea of what you're talking about, when, you know, when that midterm week comes, or that finals week comes, and they're just as busy as you are, right? Um, and then the final check-in I put in is when you have that sort of working draft going, and that one, that could be your professor again, but also the writing center. You know, you made a great point about feeling like the writing center is another way to create a deadline for you, and I totally agree. Um, so having sort of a fresh set of eyes looking over your papers is great. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? Cool. So I put an example on here of what would probably be the scariest zone scenario, which is a, like a semester long like research essay is what this is. So like maybe a thesis project when you're getting um, all the way towards the end. And the reason why, like, I just wanna actually use one I, I sort of adapted from what I saw online. And the reason why I like this one so much, and what I actually wanna draw your guys' attention to, obviously it's long, right? It's, it's pretty much a 10 week long, you know, um, writing plan. But look when the actual writing happens. The actual writing doesn't start until week six, if you guys can see that. And they actually only work on that first draft like for maybe two weeks. They hit like week eight and that is when they're actually going on and shifting over to the editing phase of the paper. Um, and that actually is something I really wanna emphasize because I think that when you think about writing an essay, we're so caught up on just getting the content on paper, right? Like we're just trying to get it done before we have to hand it in and that's fair, but you'll actually find one of the things that's been most jarring for me as a grad student is realizing like how little writing actually counts for my writing time. <laughs> like it's so much planning and it's so much editing that if we're actually thinking about a sandwich, the actual draft writing of my process is probably only a third. Like I'm writing a thesis right now and I feel like it took me a month and a half just to outline, which was crazy to me. It, it was totally new, but it was productive because that was my time to work through really big ideas. Um, so obviously, if you're writing a three-page paper, don't take a month and a half to outline. But you know, it's okay to take a couple of days to really figure out what you're trying to trying to work through. It makes the actual writing a lot less stressful and a lot stronger. Um, so we're we're gonna kind of play with that a little bit. Do you have any questions about this though? No. Does this feel pretty good? Does this seem daunting? You can tell me. It's okay. It's okay. We can we can feel it out. Does it feel daunting or does it feel okay? It feels a little daunting. A little daunting? Yeah. yeah, I mean this is also a very big one, right? So let's kind of think about if this was a three, four <coughs> three to four page paper, right? You're not gonna be doing all of these steps, but you can sort of break it down in sort of, I like to, for me, I like to think of things in terms of hours, right? Like how long do I really need to spend brainstorming for a three to four page paper? Honestly, maybe not long if the assignment's already made for you. <laughs> like my question's already made. So my brainstorming session is really actually thinking about responses and we're gonna talk about that if that was the case. You know, and so that might be three or four hours, right? My outlining, I might sit down and do the next day, that might take one or two days. My actual drafting might take one or two days and then I'm editing. So this is a, a very, very big one. But this is just a way of thinking about ways you might wanna stretch things out and breaking things into like sort of small, like a little bit more easier to navigate steps as opposed to sort of seeing everything as one big project. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Didn't I tell you that was the scary part? Congratulations, you survived. You survived time management. We made it through. I'm really proud of everyone in the room. <laughs> so, now we have, um, so now we have an idea of pace, right? We have an idea of rhythm, what we have to make out. Let's actually think of ways we can organize it and um, make it a little bit easier to navigate. So. If you mention it, if you remember at the very beginning, I said your first steps so should be doing your reconnaissance work, right? Like reviewing before you start writing. That is all going to depend on how strong your class notes are. Your strong, your class notes, I would honestly say, are the most vital part of your writing experience. You know, if you are, especially if it's for like say like an English class or a humanities class where you're writing about a particular text, something you've been talking about in class. Or if it's a research paper, so like say it's psych or social, you're doing research on a project that you've been working on or a topic you've been working on in class, your notes are invaluable. And the reason why they're invaluable is because they're yours, right? You know at the very least, you know what you're talking about. So 
Um, I can't emphasize enough how good it is to have like really strong notes that make sense to you. And there's kind of ways you might want to play with this to make your notes a little bit stronger. Um, the first is thinking about um, a color-coded tab system. If you're doing a textbook reading, it can be really helpful. Or if you're doing fictional reading, it can be really helpful. Um, so what I mean by color-coded tabs is that, you know what? I actually probably have them in my pocket because I'm never without them. I'm really not. Oh, see? I'm not kidding. I'm never without them. They're right here. <laughs> Little color-coded post-its. Uh, we actually keep these in LSS. This is like when we had a choice of like what sort of student giveaway squad we wanted, this was actually my pick. That's how much I like color-coded tabs. Um, and the reason why I like them is, so I'm in the English program, right? So I'm doing a lot of fictional reading. I'm reading about a novel a week. So I will not remember a novel a week. I, there's no magic cure to that. They're, they're gone by week seven. It's a constant restart button. So the way that I remember them is I actually create a tab for each theme, right? And you can actually tell if you can see on this one, the blue is gone, because I always save one color for what I find particularly important. And I use that same color no matter the class, no matter the topic. I always use blue colored tabs for points that I find extremely important. So that way I know if I go to sit down and write an essay and I have no idea what I want to write about, I'm going to turn back to that page that I found really important. And I'm going to see what kind of struck me or inspired me. Um, you can do the same with fiction. You can also do the same in a textbook. You can do colors by topic. You know, you can play with it. You know, um, the other way to do it is: Has anyone used Cornell Notes before? Has anyone seen this before? Yeah, some high, yeah, some high schools are actually doing this. Did you guys see this in high school by chance? Yeah, I know that was like shocking to me. That's great. They actually sell notebooks like built like this at Staples now. You know, if you're feeling fancy, I'm like cheap, so I just <laughs> use my pen. But uh, Cornell Notes, for, for you guys who haven't heard of it before, it's a note-taking system. It's really straightforward. Your running notes go in this big one in the middle. This side column, your cue column, is what you can use to make references later. So if there's a really partic like particularly important term, if there's something you don't want to forget, um, you can all put it in there. I actually put symbols in this, in this corner. So like I use like exclamation marks and certain dashes, um, kind of like a bullet point journal to remember what I felt like. For example, like if it's, it's something I find really confusing, sometimes I do question marks, but question marks upset me, so I do, I do dashes. That's just a weird me thing. Um, and the bottom here is, is for summary, so doing a little bit recap. Um, but another one I would say is actually for questions. Like for example, if you're like, this would actually make a really interesting essay question, I have a question about this, I don't want to forget it, this is a good place to put it. Um, and the reason why I actually want to point this out is you can use this for your in-class notes if you want, because obviously it can be very helpful, but I actually think the most helpful way to apply Cornell notes is when you start doing research essays, these are a, a blessing. And the reason why is you're kind of, you can do summary notes of the research that you're doing. So for example, if I'm doing like a secondary research reading, I kind of do the note-taking area part. I kind of use it to summarize like a little bit. Like I kind of point out maybe key points, like things I don't want to forget. Um, I use the Q column for like question marks, exclamation points, kind of yeah, like queuing things I don't want to uh, things I don't want to forget. And I actually use the summary column at the bottom for questions for my professor um, or connections to the week prior. So if you're actually sitting down, like say you're doing a history research paper, these can be really handy because when you actually are reading, like especially if you're not sure if you're going to need it yet or not, this is a way to kind of break down information in a way that makes sense to you because it's written in your own language. And you have it so that when you go to return to that article and you realize, hey, that article was important. I don't want to forget it. Don't navigate the actual article's language again. Just turn to your notes. Um, and it makes the whole process a lot faster. And the other beauty of it is if you actually put the page numbers as you're going, you've already cited things. So like, I'm like summary for pages 9 to 10 or you know, important quote, page 10. You know? um, does that make sense to everybody? So just a couple of ways you, wanna, you might want to have some notes to help you out when you go to sit down and writing. Okay. So we're not going to spend too long on this unless you guys want me to. If we can gauge this and how you guys are feeling. How do you guys feel about thesis writing? You can tell me. You can tell me clearly. Yeah. Huh? To do it. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, like which way? Yeah. Any other any other thoughts about it? On thesis writing? Something you feel okay about, something you feel like you could do better? Yeah? Go ahead. Mm, and yeah. So yeah, I actually think those are two really good points because you guys brought up two really important things. The one is the process for writing a thesis is very different in college than high school. That's completely true. Um, even if you were doing like AP classes in high school, it's still very different. Um, and we're we're going to talk about that and why that is. And the other point is, yeah, it actually is going to depend a lot on the field that you're writing for. And obviously the style of writing a professor is looking for, right? Every time we have a professor, I think it's really important to have like a strong writing tone, like this is kind of who I am as a writer. But especially if you're kind of still figuring that out, your writing is gonna vary depending on the, on the you know, expectations of the professor, right? It should, because we're trying to get a grade, right? So it's like kind of finding the balance between the two. Um, I would say to both of those, the key to finding a thesis and you're trying to figure out like how much sort of preamble do I need, is basically thinking about what do I need if I were to like walk into a room and tell someone I'm arguing, what would they need to know before I start arguing? That's kind of the way to think about the introduction. Like what do I need before I get to that thesis part, right? And then the other thing to build up to when you're thinking about a thesis compared to high school is high school thesis are very much about trying to get you to explain your ideas, like what you're arguing. So it's very much about the what, right? Like what are you talking about? Um, and so, especially if you're doing a lot of the five paragraph writing, like I'm gonna be doing X, Y, and Z. When you get into college, you're still doing that what, that's still gonna be part of your thesis, but a bigger part of the thesis in college, I would actually argue is why, right? Why am I making this argument? This is what I'm arguing, but why am I actually making it? Why should I care? Why is it important? So, I actually think about thesis writing as a two part sort of question. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? And it's okay if the why right now is like because I have to. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm just trying to figure that out. You know, that's a kind of a trickier question to ask. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about why this is a working thesis. But when you're thinking about a working thesis, there's a couple of different ways to get started. For me, I actually think it's a lot easier to make a working thesis if you put it into a question first, right? So like if you're trying to think about um, for example, like if it's for like a 1975 class, a lot of times you get prompts. So that part is actually done for you, right? So like they already kind of have a question. A good way to get started from there is turn their question into a statement and then kind of add your own take on it. Does that make sense? So that's a good way to kind of start with a basic what if you already have a prompt. If you're kind of doing outside research to make the question, Think about the things you're asking yourself when you're reading, like why am I reading? Why am I reviewing my notes? What am I looking for? Um, does that make sense in terms of finding the what? Is there any questions on that? No? Yeah? And that's kind of the most important part when you're actually getting started, is, is finding your what. Your why is probably gonna come later. Sometimes you come in, especially if it's a class you're feeling really good about, you might have a why in your head already, and if that happens, that's great. But if it doesn't, that's okay, right? You can come back to it, it's a working thesis. Um, a couple other things you might want to think about is like what evidence might I need to prove my point if you found your what. Um, are, are thinking about relationships. Like what kind of thesis am I looking for? Am I looking for here's a problem and I'm posing a solution? Or are you thinking a little bit more theoretical? Like this is what I'm arguing. This is kind of why it matters. This is the population it might affect or influence. Um, this is what it might change. Does that make sense? So thinking about relationships can be really helpful too when you're doing thesis writing. So if you're thinking about, okay, I have a thesis, right, ish, I at least have a question to kind of get me started, or I have a prompt that I want to respond to, the next step is thinking about how you want to brainstorm that thesis. Um, and I'm a really big fan of like visuals, making things as visual as possible. So like, do you guys, have you ever done idea webs or things in high school? Yeah, or like you could do Venn diagrams or lists. I actually gave you guys one. Um, that was maybe a little bit different than what you guys have done before. I use arrows. 
if I'm thinking through things. This, this one can be really helpful if you already have a prompt, right? If you're maybe like stuck between like maybe two or three prompts and nothing's really striking you, this one's good because you can actually kind of like, all right, here's my topic ideas. I turned it into a statement already so I kind of know what I'm looking for. I can go to the book, look for evidence, and then I can kind of turn it into an argument based off that. Does that make sense? Um, so that's just another way of organizing it, you know, aside from like idea webs, also thinking about arrows and other relationships. Um, T charts too, if you're doing like a compare and contrast kind of argument, or maybe you're looking at two texts, right? Um, I was TAing last semester, and honestly, I had one student, we talked about uh, gender, and I said, well, yeah, gender is a really interesting topic, but that's really like an umbrella, that's a huge topic. So we drew a giant umbrella, <laughs> and we wrote gender in the middle, and we made raindrops for different ideas that she had. Like, you can get creative. You can have as much fun with it as you want. I genuinely think that if you make it fun, you're less inclined to feel frustrated by it. Okay. So, we have a question. We kind of maybe have some sort of brainstorming-ish ideas. Thinking about how to make writing less daunting, if there is one step, I would say there's two critical steps, outlining and editing to make writing less daunting, but this one is really the big one. If you want a good hack for, for making writing a lot, of, a lot easier to approach, especially if you're the kind of person who struggles to get started, is actually outlining. Um, because you're not committing to every, anything, right? You're just kind of getting started. Um, so this is a skeleton outline. If you guys have ever heard that term before. Um, I think of it as a skeleton because it's, it's the bones. These are the, this is the bare minimum of what I need to actually get going, right? But it's also a really strong foundation. Um, so obviously that working thesis that you were kind of playing with, that question or that statement you kind of been playing with, um, putting in really strong topic sentences, and then for your conclusion, just putting in a rephrasing of your thesis frame right now, you know? Um, or sometimes I say to students, if they have like a really interesting idea but they know it's beyond the scope of their paper, put it in their outline under the conclusion. Because we know how they always tell you your conclusion should be like, maybe like tying a bow around an idea or maybe bringing in where it could go next. That could be that question that you kind of maybe have in your head and you can kind of save it for that. Um, in terms of the body paragraphs, honestly, I, for me personally, I keep my body paragraph outlines as, as really straightforward. So this is totally you, this is totally up to you. If you're the kind of person that you think better with like full, complete thoughts, you can actually write a few sentences and play with them if you want. If you're the kind of person that's like, you know, that's actually a little bit daunting for me because the whole reason why I outline is because I struggle to get started. Start with that argumentative topic sentence and literally just put the page number where you're getting your evidence from to build from. Um, and, and that way you at least know where you're turning to. Does that make sense, everybody? I feel like this is probably like, is that, this is how everyone pretty much outlines? Yeah, it's a tried and true method, you know? Okay. So, you're brainstormed your outline, where now? Mm. So, getting started is probably the hardest part. When, when students say, like, what's just me about writing, typically getting started is, is the response I hear the most, right? It's like that moment where you sit down and the computer's in front of you and you really know you have to get going. So, when you're thinking about um, how to get started writing, there's actually two ways to do it. Have you guys ever heard the term free writing before? Yeah? Yeah, free writing is kind of when you just sit down and you just set, you maybe set a timer for 15 minutes and you just write, right? You're not looking for perfection, you just write. Um, I like free writing because if you have an idea stuck in your head, that's a great time for you to free write. You know, if you find you're like repeating a lot of sentences or a lot of phrases, that's totally fine. Free writing is a place for you to do it. Um, so free writing is a really good place to get started. But maybe one you guys haven't heard before, have you heard of the loop method? That one might be new. Yeah, loop method's like free writing, but it's a little bit more structured. So if free writing is just you sitting down and like I'm just gonna get some words on the page and I'm just gonna write for 15 minutes, loop writing is like that, but then you're adding in the next step. So with loop writing, what you're going to do is, yeah, you sort of free write for 10, 15 minutes and then actually pause your timer and read what you just wrote, right? And there's a couple of things to look for. One, if there's a sentence that really kind of catches your eye, Right? You're like, okay, that's, that's what I was getting towards. That's one you want to pull aside. Or if there's a sentence that you repeated a lot, that's one you want to put aside. You know? 
or a sentence that you know, goes in a completely different direction than anything else. You want to put that one aside. And what that actually does is use those sentences that you pulled aside and make them into topic sentences. So like if I repeated a sentence like three times, to start your next loop, you actually take that sentence, make it a topic sentence, and then free write based around that topic sentence. And what you'll find is all of a sudden you're actually not free writing anymore. You're just writing. You're just writing a paragraph. But it feels a lot less stressful than if you're like, I'm in the mindset of I'm writing a body paragraph tonight. Does that make sense? So if you get a lot, if you're the kind of person that feels a lot of anxiety in terms of it gets started, that is actually a really helpful method. Um, it's a way of kind of tricking your brain into think that you're not really writing when you actually are. Is everyone with me? Yeah? Cool. All right. So this is the last step. So editing. Um, if there is one stress hack I want you to leave with, uh, it is editing. Um, and the reason why is that I think one of the, the most stressful, part, stressful parts about college writing is we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to make our ideas perfect from the gate. Like, right, we, you had mentioned this at the very beginning. It's, you know, um, I want to go in feeling like I have a plan and knowing what I'm going to say and I don't want to spend all much, I don't want to spend more time on this than I have to because I have three other essays. I just kind of want to get it done, right? And all that kind of spirals very quickly and makes environments that are really stressful. So editing is a way to kind of help with all of that. Um, and the reason why I like editing so much is because if you kind of go into that mindset of like, yeah, I'm leaving a few days or I'm leaving a few hours, I know I'm going to come back and edit, it makes it a lot stressful. It makes it a lot less stressful when you're writing because you can say to yourself, you know what, I can come back to this. You know, I don't. The sentence isn't perfect. It's maybe not saying what I wanted to say, but I can come back. Or I know I'm repeating myself right now. I know I just used however like two sentences ago, <laughs> but I can come back and I can change it. And it's a lot easier to make those sort of like finicky detail changes once you've already kind of have your main ideas on the page. Um, the other reason why I like editing is. It's a lot easier, you had mentioned earlier that it's hard when you're kind of pausing and stopping with tones of voice changing and sort of your thought cha pattern changing. Editing is where this can be really helpful. So if you have a 10 page paper, realistically, it's really difficult to sit down and write that in one day, right? Like, I listen, I've done it. <laughs> it wasn't great. <laughs> I wasn't a happy person, but it happened. I'm not proud of it, right? But it's hard. It's physically and mentally difficult to write like more than like a couple of pages in a day, right? We all know that. But it is a lot easier to edit, like maybe eight or ten pages in a day, or four or five pages in a day. So the beauty of that is when you're looking at a larger scheme of things, if you're looking at sort of the paper holistically when you edit, you can see things like tone of voice changing, or um, you know, like little jarring moments where like, you know what, that paragraph doesn't really make sense anymore now that I see it with everything else, as opposed to doing that while you're actually making your first draft. Um, so it's good for small changes, but it's actually really good for larger changes too, like tone of voice and making sure things are coherent. Um, so in terms of editing, I mean, you guys obviously, I know you know how to edit, but I did want to just point out two ways of editing that maybe you haven't tried that might be kind of helpful. Um, the first is reverse outlining. Has anyone ever heard of that? Yeah. Did you ever do it in high school? Uh, no, actually my uh, professor's first semester in high school, reverse outline reading, so Oh, yeah. Mm. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's a lot of work, though. <laughs> that's, a lot, that's a lot of work, reverse outlining someone else's writing, but yeah, totally. Yeah, so, so you heard it before. So reverse outlining is actually when you take a full product and you turn it back into an outline. So it's like that weird chicken egg thing. It's turning the chicken back into an egg. Um, so what I like about reverse outlining when it comes to essay writing is what I actually do, and I, st I still do this. Like I, I'm writing my thesis right now. I have about 50 pages or so. I've, I'm actually reverse outlining it right now. Um, what you actually do is take your thesis and take every topic sentence that you have and then take the last sentence from every paragraph you have and put it underneath the topic sentence and actually read it. If your topic sentences don't make sense when they're, when they're together like that, you know that you have an organization error. 
somewhere, right? Um, and the reason why I love reverse outlining so much is it's a way to make really, really big changes without feeling like you're doing a lot of work, you know? Like, so for example, let's say you pull your three topic sentences out and you kind of read them side by side and you realize, oh wow, this last one actually be really good if it was first. You're reorganizing your outline without even realizing you're reorganizing your complete ideas, right? You're seeing your argument as opposed to seeing all the details and the language and the quotes that you're trying to put in. So um, it's really handy. Um, the other thing I would think about too is keeping a manuscript. So manuscript is what it sounds like. <laughs> so it is that, let's say you do big changes, right? You delete sentences, you delete a quote, things that you don't, you know, decide you don't need anymore. Does anyone do writing where you like keep all of your rolling thoughts underneath your good draft? Does anyone write like that? Yeah, yeah, some people do that. I do that, right? Um, so like, I'll like write ideas out and then I'll scrap them and I copy and paste it below. Yeah, that's essentially what this is, except putting it on a separate Word doc. Um, so it's taking those things that you edit out or maybe, like, maybe you have brainstorming pages, maybe you have a working thesis page, putting it all on a separate Word document, making a folder and putting it on your computer. And the reason why that's so valuable is that if it's a class that's actually for your major, you might be able to use it again. It's actually how I got my thesis idea. I had like thought of it from a topic I had for a final paper, realized it was like not relevant to the paper I was writing, and then I went back and I was reading my notes ideas, and I was like, oh wow, I actually really liked that. So it worked out. Um, it's really helpful if you have a class you have to do two papers in. Because if you have to do like a midterm and a final, and, it's, and especially if it's a book that might be on both, you can return to it. You know, and you might be able to get ideas for next time. Um, likewise, you might decide that once you actually outline that you're missing something and you've already saved it on a separate Word document. So it's just like a good handy thing to keep in mind. It's also super satisfying at the end of the semester if you get to delete it. <laughs> like you're like, I'm not an English major. I don't need English 1975. Out it goes. And it is like, it's like that last day of high school when you throw out all your binders. It's great. Um, does that make sense, everybody? Mm. Any questions about editing at all? No? Feels okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, so we're gonna end with confidence, right? Um, we're gonna end with the um, life advice section <laughs> to like take away. Um, so the thing is, all of these things, all of these suggestions that we've talked about in the last hour, they can be really helpful, but they can also be very hard to do if you're in a bad headspace. Right, if you're feeling really stressed out, if you have a million other assignments. Um, so I would actually say like confidence is the dark horse of, of writing, um, it really is. So ways that you might wanna help your confidence. This actually was um, not my idea. This is <laughs> when, I, when I went abroad in Ireland this summer, I worked with a theater director and she actually does this for her plays and I thought it was so brilliant. Um, if you're the kind of person that you really feel like you, you struggle with your writing or you really feel like you struggle with your confidence, it's okay. I would actually tell you, instead of running away from that negative feeling, just embrace it for a second. And make a list of all the things that you're afraid of. What don't you want your writing to be? Um, where do you feel like you struggle as a writer? Um, the woman I worked with in the summer, she actually wrote it on a wall, like in her little tiny apartment. Like she had a whole nightmare wall of things that she was afraid of. Like, I don't want people to laugh at me. I don't want people to laugh at my play, you know? Um, and then what you can actually do is think about how you can turn it into positives. So, for example, something that I always worry about is like I want to make sure what I'm saying is actually like an original idea. And like, what if it's not? What if it's not? What if it's not? Right? A way to say that is like I'm concerned that my ideas aren't original, and turning it into my ideas are original for X, Y, and Z. Like, actually answer that why and why it is. And it's just kind of an easy way of like sort of changing your mentality towards your project, while still at the same time like validating that, yeah, it's okay to be stressed out, it's okay to sort of be worried about this paper. Um, the other thing I would advise is find, they're called writing rituals. Find yourself a really good set of writing rituals and totally make it personal to you. So, um, there's a couple of things to think about. The first, obviously, is your space, right? Where do you feel like you write really well? Um, how many of you guys write in your bed? No? Nobody? That's so, yeah, sometimes? That's great. 
running in your bed is not a horrible thing. I would say just like invest in the little desk thing, you know what I mean, that you can put on your bed so that you're not laying down. Um, but, and, and think about the kind of writing you do when you're in your bed, do you know what I mean? Like if it's a little response paper, I'm like, that's okay. If it's like serious research, then it's like investing in a chair is great, <laughs> you know? Um, but, you know, figure out where it is that you write best. What kind of space do you like? Do you like total silence? Do you like a little background noise? You know, um, do you like Falvey, for example? You know, what floor of Falvey do you like? You can go up by volume, right? Um, things like that. Also think about, this is gonna sound silly, but actually sincerely think about the kind of lighting that you like. You know, like studies say that cool lighting helps us focus better, but cool lighting is actually a lot, so like the fluorescent lighting, but it's actually a lot harsher on your eyes, you know? Um, so like, the, you know, you might find that it keeps you awake, but maybe it gives you a little bit of a headache. So you actually might want to find places where you can write with lots of sunlight, for example, or find places, you know, different grades of, of lamps. I know it sounds weird, but it really does help. Um, the other thing to think about is having all of your supplies in front of you when you sit down to write. So like having a set list of things that you know you need when you write, when you're thinking about rituals. So for example, my writing ritual is I have a giant actual container of Cheez-Its next to my desk. And I almost always have baby carrots on the other side if I want to make good choices, or at least feel like I made good choices. And I have all of the books that I'm using sort of categorized on the floor next to me. And I have a five-year-old in my house, so I have uh, very good noise-canceling headphones and a lock on my door. <laughs> so uh, of ways to actually get a little bit of privacy. You know, so think about the things that you need when you're right. Make sure that they're on hand and in front of you before you get started so that you don't have an excuse of when you find a really good writing zone to have to actually get up and walk away to get something. Um, another thing to think about is like making writing playlists. So if you have Spotify, they have some that already exist. But, you know, that could be white noise. It could be, you know, jazz. It could be certain music that you like in terms of concentrating. You know, um, I, like acoustic, I like acoustic music only because it's hard when someone is talking in my ear, but that doesn't mean, you know, you might find that you really like it. You might find one song you really like that kind of, especially if it's related to your topic and you're like, yeah, this is cool. <laughs> you might like vibe to that and that's, and that's fun too. Um, and finally, I would actually say play with your space. Um, so when I say like make some art, like if you're really creative, you could totally make some art for your space. But actually put your writing goals and put your outline, put it on the wall of your dorm, you know? Actually have it in front of you. Um, it makes, it sounds silly, but it can actually be helpful sometimes to like think outside of your computer screen, you know, and visualizing your arguments um, and make changes. So like something that I do, for example, is when I actually sit down to edit the paper, I actually print it out and I like turn it into a diagram if you guys have ever seen the David Bowie documentary, this is how David Bowie writes songs, well, did write songs. Um, it's actually like I take my ideas and I outline, and I outline by actually like making a diagram on the floor. Um, and I realize that like if it's like crazy, like if my diagram's all over the place, it's because my outline is crazy and my ideas aren't cohesive. Um, so then I think about like, okay, what kind of shape do I want? And I kind of organize it by that. Um, so if you have like a really long thesis project or a really long research paper, that can be kind of fun and helpful. Okay, cool. Um, and then finally, obviously, manage your stress. One of the best things that you can do for your writing is not writing. <laughs> that sounds silly, I know. If it's due tomorrow, I know you have to write. But taking breaks from writing is actually really helpful because sometimes you'll find, I don't know if you guys have ever had this feeling like where you're really struggling to write and then you get up, maybe you go for a walk or you get a shower and all of a sudden you're like, got it, right? And it comes, it comes to you. It's because your, your brain's actually relaxing. You know, it's finding that sort of little bit of a distraction that can help. So a couple of ways to manage your stress that aren't writing, specifically writing related. Um, the first is obviously like be realistic. If there are things that you can say no to the week an essay is due, say no to them, you know? Um, that's okay, you know, it's okay to have to prioritize your time, you know? Um, you know, obviously exercising, yoga, going for a walk, anything that gets your blood flowing is really healthy, that's really great, that can be helpful. It can also get some stress and some tension out if you're like, for example, are like taking a kickboxing class or something. <laughs> um, you know, try doing things with your hands. If you're not a sports person, it could be knitting, it could be cooking, kind of doing something creative, 
to get your mind off of it and onto a certain hobby, right? Um, and then I'm, it's going to sound silly, but write something else, you know? Um, if you have like maybe a longer paper and a short little response paper, you might want to actually write the short response paper first um, because it'll help your confidence if you're like, you know what, I got one done, you know, I feel good about that one and I can, I can go and work on the longer assignment, you know, when I'm already kind of in a good workflow. Or journaling, you know, um, so you could try anxiety journaling, for example, you know, to actually write out what it is that you're worried about if you're feeling particularly stressed about a paper. Um, sort of what we were talking about earlier, you know, of turning things into positives, you know, actually just like taking five minutes to kind of sort of air how you're feeling. And then again, you can have that sort of satisfying moment of just kind of ripping it up and throwing it away. Um, and then obviously get some sleep. <laughs> so um, sleep is, if, there, if, if editing is one of the unsung heroes of writing, then sleep is, is the, the king of them all. <laughs> so, um, your brain does not function well if you don't have any sleep. It's, it kind of goes without saying. And taking some time to actually rest is part of the, one of the best things that you can do for your stress level. So if you're thinking about, if we're gonna go back to where we started and doing time management, if you do break it down into easier steps, one of the biggest benefits of that is you can actually make the time, you can schedule at the time where you stop. You know, this is, I don't write past nine or 10 o'clock. That's, that's the time where I relax, I unwind. I do a show on Netflix and I go to sleep. Um, so that's, that's really helpful. Um, and then obviously, if you're gonna be doing all of these on writing related things, actually keep a way to record your ideas handy. Because if ideas do come to you, one of the worst things ever is if you get an idea and you have no way to write it down. Um, so that could be as simple as everyone pretty much carries a phone at this point. You can just actually record the note on your phone. You don't even have to bother finding something to write with or text, you know, writing it out on text or anything. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, so I guess the last thing I would say is another way in terms of navigating stress is actually create a network for yourself. Um, so obviously the Writing Center, keep in mind that the Writing Centers do individual papers, but they also do workshops. You know, things like this, or for example, thesis writing, something you feel like we didn't cover, you can handle it there. Um, learning support, we do coaching too, right? Um, and obviously, if you feel like your anxiety is going beyond writing, if it's something that's really interfering with your with your day-to-day -day life, right? The Counseling Center is a, a crucial resource and then something, uh, a topic that they work with a lot. Um, and I would obviously too, I would mention that your friends can be a really great resource, especially from their class. You know, keep each other accountable. Like my friends for my thesis writing project, we send daily texts to each other every day <laughs> just to see how we're doing. And your professors. In terms of office hours, but also if you actually get that paper back and it goes really well, you might actually want to stop by their office and ask them what did they like about it, right? Especially if you have a final coming up, figure out what it is they really liked about the paper so you can kind of reenact it for the final. Um, all right, cool. So do you guys have any questions for me though? Anything we feel like we didn't cover? No? Feeling okay? Does this feel a little less daunting now? Yeah? Cool. All right. Can I ask you guys a quick question then? Can I ask you guys how you, uh, how you found your way here today? How you heard about us? Yeah, go ahead. You can shout it out, honestly. <laughs> cool. Yeah? Cool. What, what, what was that answer? Uh, uh, Send an email. Okay. okay. All right, cool. I was just curious. Um, all right. So if you guys think of any questions, though, I have my card up here. If you want to email me, if you want to follow up, I'm happy to do it. All right. But thank you guys so much for coming. It was really fun. <laughs>